Welcome to everyone who's joining us at the moment while we're waiting for the last few people to log in. It'd be great if you could let us know who is out there through the chat. Don't be shy, I can see there are at least 30 of you out there already. Oh, hi David, good to see you. Is this, I've got a feeling you've made every session. Oh, and another David, anyone out there who's not called David? Oh, hi Simon, great, oh. Fabulous, flooding in now, brilliant. Oh, brilliant, some new names, some familiar names. Great to see you all coming through. Wonderful, we'll just give everyone a couple more minutes and then we'll get cracking. We've gone across the Irish Sea. Fantastic. What a great range of people. So um, we'll give them one more minute and then we will kick off. Lovely to see you, Fran, from Shropshire and Telford, a new um, community energy group that's forming up there, as well as some... Um, longer established group like Marlo joining us and oh hi Alan from a Sustainable Wanted one of our groups right I think we should get going so thank you so much to everyone who's already introduced yourself if you haven't had a moment to yet do let us know who's out there via the chat function um, I'm Saskia Huggins, I'm the Social Impact Director at the Low Carbon Hub. The Low Carbon Hub is the Oxfordshire based social enterprise that is out to prove that we can meet the UK's energy needs in a way that's good for people and good for the planet. You're joining us for the final in a series of webinars that's all been focused on the future of energy and the transition to a renewable energy future, with a particular focus on Project LEO. For those of you who don't already know, Project LEO, or Local Energy Oxfordshire, as LEO stands for, is a £40 million project conducting real-world trials to understand the role that local energy can play in accelerating the transition to a zero-carbon energy system. So those who were here last week will know we hosted a webinar with Paige Mullen from Nuve, and she was exploring the role of electric vehicles in Project LEO. We had a really great turnout for that, but if you did miss it, you can find that and all our other webinars recordings on the Low Carbon Hub's YouTube channel. We will also be recording tonight's webinar, so um, that will be available um, on our YouTube channel later this week. I also want to take a quick moment before we dive into today's topic, um, just to thank all of you who've joined us for a webinar, or in some cases I can see all those webinars over the course of the past few months. We're going to be having a break from the webinars for August, but we'd really appreciate it if you could spare us a couple of minutes of your time to give us some feedback. There'll be a survey going out in the next couple of days to everyone who's attended or signed up from a webinar. And we'd be so grateful if you could just spare us a moment to fill it in and let us know how you found these sessions. It's going to be really helpful for us because we're planning a new series for later in the year. So that feedback would be really helpful. And Zoe has also popped a list in case you needed a reminder of what all those topics were. She's popped a list of all the webinars on the YouTube channel in the chat function. So with that said, um, let's get on to tonight's webinar. Our topic tonight is the role of flexibility in a net zero energy system. And I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker, Graham Oakes, who is a system engineer with 35 years experience working for a whole range of organizations from Cisco, Skype, Sony and Vodafone, and Amnesty International, Greenpeace and Oxfam to name but a few and he's been helping them develop high-tech systems, products and services. He came across into the energy sector in 2013 when he founded Upside Energy and that was in response to a challenge prize sponsored by the National Grid. 
Since the beginning of 2019, Graham's been really focusing on helping organisations develop products that enable people to engage with and benefit from the energy transition through the use of local community and municipal energy. We're really lucky at the Hub that um, Graham, Graham is currently working with us, mentoring um, some of our project managers as we're developing the smart and fair um, neighbourhood trials as part of Project Leo. For those of you who don't know what those are, flick back and find Scott Wheeler's session from um, earlier in the webinar series. So um, Graham said he's really happy to take questions during the talk. So um, the best way to pose your questions is to use the chat function. We hope to answer as many as we, as we can over the next hour. But for now, it's over to you, Graham. It's great. Thanks, Saskia. And hello, hello everybody. So yeah, as Saskia said, I'm, I'm, my background is in tech. I sort of grew up in data and um, big tech systems, came into the energy sector around about seven years ago now to form Upside Energy, which was looking at this problem of how do we engage people and in this case, particularly domestic and small business consumers to shift their energy demand from peak to off peak times. Um, and that that's a, a growing problem for the energy system. And these days is encompassed in this, this term flexibility. So I want to spend today just giving a bit of an overview of what flexibility is, what it means to the energy system and a little bit about how people can start to, or how people may be engaged in this um, provision of flexibility to the system. And the, the way I plan to drive that is to go right back to basics and, and look at how do you boil a kettle? Then why is this challenging for renewables? Well, why does a, a renewably driven net zero system find boiling a kettle quite different to the way our current electricity system operates? What does this mean for flexibility? Where does this mean that we need new and different types of flexibility. What does that mean for the overall energy system, for our objectives to hit a net zero system and for the way that system may operate? And then finish with a bit of speculation about how people might take part in that provision of flexibility to the system. So going back to basic, starting with a kettle. I hit the switch half a dozen times a day and the kettle boils, I make my coffee and I think almost nothing about it and most of us do the same. It's, it's scary when you think about the number of times you hit a switch to turn lights on and off, to do the kettle, the microwave, um, whatever other appliances you've got. We, we just do this unthinkingly and by some sort of amazing magic that the kettle boils, the steam comes out, we get what we want. And I want to sort of drill in behind that. And the first thing that happens when I hit that switch is somewhere on the system, a power station. It's probably a gas powered station, um, probably at the combined cycle gas turbine somewhere, fires up and it, it magically knows that I've hit the switch and it needs to suck a little bit more gas into the, the turbines or into the combustion chamber to drive the turbines a little bit faster so that they can generate some electricity to boil my kettle. That station may be hundreds of kilometers away from me. It may, maybe could be almost anywhere in the country, anywhere on the, the UK's grid to boil my kettle for me through this magic. Again, it's really interesting when you drill into this about how that signal happens because there's, there's no signal from my switch to the power station. It's connected via the, the cables, the electricity cables, but nothing else. It's not as if there's a internet connection or something that tells this power station to fire up. It's all done through the magic of my hitting the switch puts a little bit more stress on the system that makes the turbines slow down a bit and then the turbines suck in some more gas to bring them up to a, a con constant speed and all runs at this constant speed which is why in the UK we run at 50 hertz we have that standard speed so that the system that 
generation knows to respond to our kettles. And so, so that, that's the first kind of amazing fact behind this is that power plant somewhere in the middle of nowhere fires up just to boil my kettle. Because it doesn't do that on its own. That power plant feeds into the high voltage transmission network and we see thousands of kilometers of cables across the country transporting that energy from those power plants to eventually big substations down progressively smaller substations eventually to some sort of local cable it's probably underground in the uk in australia where i grew up a lot of those cables are like this running on poles but here most of them are buried but eventually it goes through that network and gets to my kettle and so this whole amazing network again thousands of kilometers of big high voltage cables coming from the power plants to the big substations then progressively smaller cables going to the small substations and eventually to my home adding up to literally millions of kilometers of cables to help all of us boil our kettles and all acting automatically behind the scenes when we hit a switch and so 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 incredibly reliable that we only really notice it on those rare occasions that it doesn't work so what happens when we put renewables into the mix? This fundamentally changes because the sun isn't gonna shine because I wanna boil my kettle or the wind isn't gonna blow stronger. So where that gas turbine would ramp up its generation capacity in response to my turning the switch on and then it would ramp back down again when I turn the switch off, the sun and the wind don't do that. They just go on in their own way. They're oblivious to what I'm doing. So when there's a excess of um, requirement demand from my kettles, they have no way of ramping up to meet that. And then when I turn my kettle off, they don't slow down to accommodate that. Then the network needs to keep a lot of extra capacity in order to respond to that. And with the renewables, we will see a lot more variability in the generation capacity that the wind gusts the sun goes behind clouds it's not all just going at a, a consistent level like traditional gas or coal or nuclear plant and so somewhere the network has to be able to accommodate the bursts of um, re generation capacity from the renewables it has to be able to accommodate the, the bursts in demand coming from me and my kettle and all the other appliances. And again, that, that's partly true now, but the network has a lot of spare capacity because we have peaks of demand on winter evenings. Um, we have the um, well-publicized peaks uh, after the Queen's speech on Christmas day and in the middle of um, set changes in Wimbledon and, and things like that. Um, and so the network has to accommodate that but as we go to net zero, the network is going to have to accommodate much more variability because it's coming from the, the renewable generation. But also we've just got that much more um, electrification of heat and transport that all of our EVs charging at different times and different patterns of use of EVs, of heating systems and things like that, that we're going to have to build a lot of extra capacity into the network to accommodate that. And the third kind of factor that I want to look at here or that is relevant to flexibility here is that the wires heat up. The element in my kettle is just designed that as I put more current into it, it heats up and boils my water. But the wires in the transmission network and the distribution network aren't fundamentally different. They operate to the same physical laws. And so as I draw more electricity through them, they heat up. And again, that's a problem now, the wires heat up and that creates losses because we're heating up the wires and that's all just going off into the atmosphere. And as a rough estimate, we're running about one nuclear plant at any given point in time just to deal with the losses due to the, the wires heating up. Um, something like six or eight percent of our electricity load goes just into waste heat from heating up the wires and the transformers and things like that. And again, as we're using more electricity, as we electrify um, heat and transport, 
that gets larger. And these, the, the laws um, around this, it's a, it's a square law that power consumed is proportional to the square of current. So actually a lot of the power consumption is at the peaks. And if you have a very peaky load profile, if you're constantly turning things on and off, it's just like when you drive a car. When you, if you drive with a heavy foot, it consumes more power, well, more fuel to get to where you're going if you're constantly accelerating and decelerating compared to if you go with a constant speed. It's exactly the same with losses on the electricity network. If we've got very peaky loads, then our losses will be higher than if we've got nice smooth loads and nice smooth generation. And so as we get to a growing volume of renewables on our system, we're gonna have more larger peaks, we're gonna have more losses. And so that's a, a major factor in the overall efficiency of the system. So what does this mean for flexibility? And again, the, the traditional energy system used the flexibility of generation. The fact that those gas plants could just suck in more gas and generate more electricity or could they could turn down the flow of gas in order to accommodate the changes in demand. Um, it's really interesting, of course, in France where they have a, a high nuclear fleet, nuclear plant can't flex in the same way. So France had to build in a lot of things like Economy 7 here, which was partly built around proje projections of nuclear fleet in the UK at one point. Um, to accommodate that flexibility, we can have things like Economy 7. And in some ways we're going back to Economy 7 type situations where we want to be able to control flexibility from the kettles rather than from the wind farms or from the solar plants which don't have that flexibility. So, so where can our flexibility come from in the system? Well the first thing is I could only have tea when the wind is blowing. So I could have a, a little light on my kettle that tells me that there's a lot of wind out there right now so now's a good time to have a cup of tea. Personally, I don't think that's going to fly. I kind of want my tea and coffee when I want it. And I think most people are that way. But there are a lot of loads in our homes, in our businesses, in our offices that can flex that way. Hot water tanks are a great example where you can heat up the hot water tank overnight when there's a lot of wind or in the afternoon when there's a lot of sun and it will store that hot water for hours for when I need it later in the day. Um, refrigerators, they, you can cool down the fridge again when there's lots of spare electricity on the system and increasingly there will be spare electricity. Again, the, the wind and the sun, we can't control it. There'll be times when there's a lot more wind and sun than we need. And so that's a good time to take the temperature of our fridges down to the bottom control limit to get them cooler than average so that later on we can turn them off when there's a bit more stress on the system. We can do the same with um, our heating in our homes and as we insulate our homes better we'll have more scope to preheat homes in the afternoon so that we don't need to run our heating systems at the peak in the evening and things like that. And also a lot of our appliances will have potentially smart appliances where we don't necessarily need to run our dishwasher or our um, spin dryer or things like that straight away. We can schedule them or ask them to run when there's a bit of excess energy on the system. So there's a smart flexibility that we can access there. There's a growing number of batteries going into the home. Um, partly this is driven by solar PV on our roofs because if I've got solar PV on my roof then I want to be able to to capture the excess um, solar generation in the afternoon so that I can use it in the evening when I'm home. But those batteries give me all sorts of flexibility. I can use the battery to run my kettle and then I can top it up slowly from the solar PV or from the wind farm that's generating in the North Sea or from wherever there's some spare capacity right now to top up my battery for when I need it. And then we sort of got the ultimate battery, the EVs that are going to be growingly on our driveways and on our streets um, because they're really just large batteries on wheels 
and so again we'll be able to partly control the charging on those EVs so that we charge them at times when there's plenty of electricity available from sun and wind. Partly we'll be able to use things like vehicle to grid and vehicle to home when we can actually run our kettles and our heating and our appliances from our EV at times when there's high stress on the system and then again recharge it when there's not quite so much demand on the system. So flexibility is fundamentally about adjusting our demand in order to match the available generation. And that what that means for the energy system is we don't need to curtail renewables. We don't need to turn off wind farms on windy um, early hours of the mornings because there's no demand for them. We can actually use those wind farms to heat our hot water, to um, warm up our homes so that they're nice and toasty when we get up in the morning or whatever else. Um, and there's less need for dirty and expensive gas and oil plant to meet those um, peak demands on winter evenings or other peak times. And we can also use that flexibility to smooth the flow across the network. So instead of having bursts of um, demand when we all turn our kettles on at certain times, the batteries in our home can meet that locally and then trickle charge in a nice smooth flow um, throughout the rest of the, the evening or the day. And so that means we don't need to have quite so much spare capacity on the network. It means we can better manage the losses on the network. And so we can run more efficient, better utilized networks, as well as better utilization of our, of our generation. Ryan, so, we've had one question come in, perhaps yep. it might be relevant at that point. Um, John is asking um, what, what might be the role for green hydrogen in capturing excess renewable energy? That's a, a really good question. And whether it's green hydrogen or um, even better blue, or no, better green hydrogen, I always get the colors mixed up. Um, yeah, that's one use of flexibility is to be running ele electrolysis plants when there's a lot of excess um, generation on the system, then use electrolysis to generate hydrogen. Um, there's a range of different scenarios for how that might happen. A lot of those electrolysis plants probably are more efficient as fairly large plants located quite close to generation. National Grid's future energy scenarios yesterday talked about um, some of those electrolysis plants may actually be sited offshore with offshore wind and then it, it's better to pipe the hydrogen to the mainland rather than to run large electric cables under some scenarios. Um, in that case, you get the benefits around matching supply to demand from the generation side, but you don't get the network benefits. You're still potentially using that hydrogen to um, run gas turbines and now clean hydrogen turbines, but you've still got the network issues around spare capacity and electricity network and around the, the flow across the network. Other, way, other times you may be using that hydrogen, pumping it into the gas network and re replacing the existing methane gas network, in which case it is um, helping to run maybe hybrid heat pumps. And so it is taking strain off the network as well. Or also you could look at models where you've actually got quite local electrolysis plants um, at, a, at a community or um, even household level generating hydrogen that you would then store locally. And again, that's also then taking the, the strain off the network. So I was going to say that might link into, I don't know if you want to answer this next question here or a little bit later on, uh, but a question from Finn asking about can a local community have its own local grid without access to the national grid? And so, Yes, that's very much the type of question that we're looking at in the LEO project and in the, the associated projects. Um, and again, local can operate at multiple different scales. Local could mean my street and it could mean that um, the collection of 
20 or 30 homes on my street or on our own local microgrid and we have one connection to the, the national networks and we might have our, our own gas turbine or um, wind farm or electrolysis plant or whatever makes sense for us local so could right. mean thinking in that scenario it, we're not um we're not looking at completely autonomous and standalone systems there would still be some connection but the idea is that you'd vastly reduce the amount of flow into that next tier so you're doing as much as you can at a local level but there would still be some interconnectedness i think conceptually if i was part of a local community i'd want to do as much as possible locally but it's not at all impossible that if my community has a wind farm and next door has a, a PV farm, then on a sunny day, it, I might want them to exchange send electricity to me on a windy day, we'll send it the other way. So, so a lot of communities try, trying to be completely sort of self-contained is probably not the most efficient way to be. And there will be lots of local communities, people in, large housing developments and things like that that just can't serve themselves and there will be days when you've got two or three sunless windless days when you need to be able to pull from a national system so it's, there's always a need for some sort of local and national exchange there it's, it's hard to see a, a purely local autonomous system but i think conceptually we there's a lot of benefits in keeping things as local as possible, partly because you don't have so many losses. If you're not going out across the large transmission network, you don't have to transport the energy so far, partly because there's an ownership factor. If, if I can see my own um, generation plant, my own facilities, that ownership is something that a lot of people value. It's very hard to put a financial value on it but that, that sense of ownership, and it's something we've lost in the energy system. People 150 years ago completely owned their energy system. They, they worked hard at, at energy. Now we've kind of lost touch with that and we sort of lose touch with the, the value. We, we, we lose a sense of, again, from my perspective, just how amazing the energy system is. It, it's been part of my journey over the last seven years just how amazing the system we've got right now is. We don't want to ignore the reliability and, and the cost effectiveness of the, the current system, but we've lost touch with that. And I think getting back in touch with that is gonna be a key part of the, the kinds of social changes that we need to make in order to get to net zero. Yeah, I think Graham, that, that point that 150 years ago, we all knew how much coal was left in our coal scuttle, didn't we? You know, we, exactly. we really could see our energy. If we take one more um, point at this stage, there are lots of questions coming in. You're um, firing lo lots of thoughts here, but if we just take one more point at this stage, sure. we'll save some to move on. Um, it was from John Stott, um, going back to um, the matching of capacity. He's made the point, he thinks that spare capacity has to match the largest single source on the system. So a uh, you know, a gigawatt connector. Is that a, a, a situation you recognize? So the sort of, there has to be capacity to accommodate um, glitches on the system, faults on the system and interconnectors to France are one of the, the biggest sources of, or potential sources of supply right now. And one of the, the most common trips on the system right now. So we do need to be able to flex to accommodate that. Um, you see events like 9th of August last year where you get a, a, some generation trips out. And in that case, there was a cascade of two or three generation plants tripped out and somewhere the system needs to be able to accommodate that. And traditionally, the system has accommodated that by having a bit of spare capacity in other large generation plants. And you can run your gas turbines at 85% of their rated load and they've always got a 15% spare and so they ramp up in order to meet those sorts of trips. Now that that works, it's very reliable. It does mean that often those um, turbines are running at not quite their most efficient set point. Um, gas turbines like to run at a very, at a sp very specific um, set of 
proportion of their rated load. If you back them off from that, they, they become less efficient. And so again, there's some losses built into that. Um, but again, in, in a distributed decentralized world, we can do the same with our EVs. There's nothing to stop a couple of hundred thousand EVs stopping their charging cycle or going from charging to um, discharging to provide support for the system. So it's, and again, one of the, the big changes, and again, National Grid called this out very clearly in, in their future energy scenarios yesterday is, is the digitalization of the system. The fact that we have now got much more control over the loads. And so it's quite possible to have a smart washing machine, a smart EV, smart heating systems, and they can therefore be configured to provide that spare capacity. And we're seeing that increasingly that we are now seeing um, home batteries being bought by the distribution networks to provide um, flexibility services to handle peaks on the network. We are seeing National Grid starting to um, work with players like Nuvi from the, the web webinar um, last week to provide frequency response services from EV batteries. So, so we can do this with the digitalization of our system with large numbers of small devices in just the same ways that we could historically do it with small numbers of large devices. So that was a well judged point to sort of have a few questions because sort of looking at what this means to the system, I wanted to sort of get a, a little bit more technical perhaps to, to sort of look at what this means for the energy system from some modeling that we did on the LEO project with Element Energy and, and Piclo um, at the back end of last year, where we looked at how would we run a net zero energy system in, in 2050. And this was before National Grid's scenarios yesterday where they um, developed some scenarios for net zero. Um, last year when National Grid did their future energy scenarios, we were still looking at an 80% or they were still looking at an 80% um, carbon reduction target and all their scenarios last year were based on an 80% reduction to our carbon outputs. This year they, they went to net zero. Um, it's really interesting. They had a, a, a what they call the sensitivity for net zero last year and they last year in their modeling, they said, well, yeah, we think we can get to net zero, um, but we still got 4% of the way there that we're not quite sure how we'll do that. We need more technical innovation. In their scenarios um, yesterday, they actually presented three scenarios that absolutely got to net zero by 2050. And one of those got there by 2048. So even between last year and this year, we've got from the point where we were sort of still relying on some innovation to get to net zero, to be confident of getting to net zero to the point where we actually now can see multiple different ways to get to net zero. So, so it's really interesting the way the system's developing. But last year with Element Energy, we built this, this scenario for a net zero energy system in 2050, um, which isn't actually too different, different as it turns out to one of National Grid's scenarios yesterday in terms of its assumptions around um, the number of EVs on the system, the type of heating on the system. And we assumed hybrid hydrogen electric heat pumps as, a, as one of the major um, causes of, or sources of home heating in this scenario. So this wasn't a, the most aggressive electrification scenario. It assumed a fairly large amount of hydrogen in the system. Uh, but this slide, I'm conscious that I love it because I'm a geek um, and there's, there's lots of complexity here. But at the bottom here, there's, there's a view of energy demand of, of the, the day with the maximum net energy demand. So this was a, a winter, probably a winter's day. Um, you see down the bottom here between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. There's a little bit of yellow with solar generation. So it was a sunny winter's day in this scenario. Um, but the, the peak demand happened round about either 7 or 9 p.m. in the evening. Um, and that peak demand, peak um, non-renewable demand. And so there was some renewables, there was some wind still in the system, but the peak non-renewable demand was about 
75 megawatts um, at 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. They're both about the same in this scenario. Um, and, and you see a, a pretty typical day here. You sort of see everyone wakes up about seven. They turn on their kettles and their lights and things like that. Um, peak sort of happens just about when everybody gets to work and turns the kettle back on again then. Um, it dips a bit in the early afternoon, ramps up again in the, the afternoon and the evening. And in this scenario, actually went quite late in the evening. And again, this was a, a 2050 scenario, so there are a lot of EVs. And so there's a lot of um, EV charging still going on um, in the sort of 7 till 9 p.m., which is why the peak actually was as late as 9 p.m. because of that EV charging. Um, important thing about this scenario, this was, it says at the top there, with passive demand. There was no um, active flexibility in the demand. When people charged in, plugged in their EVs, they charged straight away, which is why you got quite a um, large peak in the evening. Now, what this is showing in the top left, this is looking at ordered, sorted by the amount of dispatchable demand um, from the, the day with the biggest demand or the hour with the biggest demand out to all the hours when that demand wasn't very large, where that, di that dispatchable demand was met from. So when it wasn't large, in this case, it's calling nuclear dispatchable generation, um, then some of it was being met by hydroflex, that's the Norwig and the pumped hydro stations. So some of that is being met by those pumped hydro stations. Um, some of it's being met by biomass. Um, and this is all driven by the cost of generation. The, the, the nuclear has got a, a low marginal cost of generation. So it's used first and then you use the pumped hydro, then the biomass, then you use the interconnector. And then eventually you get to the, the gas CCGT, combined cycle gas turbines. And so for around about 20% of the year, that peak demand is being met by gas turbines and it doesn't quite show that actually gets to a peak demand on one hour of the year of 75 megawatts, which means that you had to have roughly 40 mega, um, gigawatts of gas turbines on the system, even though 10 gigawatts of that is really only used for about one or maybe four hours of a year of the year. So, so that's some very expensive gas turbines built there just for that very rare occasion that it's used. Um, the top right of this diagram looks at the same sort of curve, um, but by demand. And this is now actually sorted by hours. So the, the left hand is, is days. This is actually sorted by hours. So this just shows the top 100 hours. And so this is the total demand, 90 odd gigawatts is that peak there at nine o'clock on the, the peak day. And again, that's 90 um, gigawatts of peak demand. Dispatchable demand was the 75 gigawatts that was met by non-renewable sources. Um, and you see that's being used largely to drive HP as heat pumps, um, DH is district heating, hybrid is the hybrid heat pump. So a lot of that's being used to run our heating in our homes. Um, there's um, not a lot of that public EV charging because this is in the evening and then that, the public charging tends to be during the day, but there's a lot of um, EVs being charged at home during those periods and a lot of base home and industrial load. And, and you see that 90 gigawatt peak for one hour of the year dropping off to very quickly to 80 gigawatts up by 100 hours and, and dropping off further from there. So again, you see quite a large peak. The, the next slide, look at that same day, but if we had flexible demand. So this is the same day, but with a lot of flexible demand from smart EV charging, smart use of heat pumps to shift demand into the um, preheating homes in the afternoons and things like that. And you see, um, now our, our peak demand previously, I'll go back one, it was in the evening, it was about 90 odd gigawatts. It's now pretty smooth throughout the day between 
65 and 75 gigawatts, a much smoother load profile across the day. And that will translate into smoother profiles on the network. So, so again, we don't have those peaky flows driving losses in the networks. We don't need quite so much spare capacity in the networks because we don't have those peaks. Um, and you see that the peaks in generation, we have quite a few less days when we don't need gas turbines and the amount of gas turbines at its peak now is actually more like 60 gigawatts than 75. We only need roughly 30, 35. We, we've got quite a lot less um, peaking gas turbine plant needed at all. So we don't need to invest in that plant that is running for only a few number of hours, very small number of hours in the year. Um, and we're not using overall as much, anywhere near as much gas. I'll come back to the, the figure in the next slide. Um, so, so we're not burning gas, so we don't have to um, do complex things like carbon capture use and storage in order to hit net zero because we're not burning gas in the first place. Um, or if it's hydrogen that we're burning, we don't need to suffer all the efficiency losses of electrolysis plants and things like that in order to create the hydrogen. And likewise, you see this, the same on the demand side, whereas it was 90 gigawatts dropping up very quickly to 80 gigawatts, it's now for the first 100 hours almost dead flat at 72 or 73 gigawatts. And so we've got this much smoother um, use of our um, capacity, actually a lot more volatility within there where it's being used. That's partly because these are different hours. These actually be hours on different days sorted. Um, but it, it, the system is using flexibility to accommodate very different circumstances at different hours on different days in order to create that much smoother flow. And that's sort of in a different view of this. And again, I'm sort of conscious that we, I, I could talk for at least another hour just about diagrams like this. Um, but this is showing ordered, sorted by um, hour or by day. So this will be sorted by day, the um, excess or of demand over generation or vice versa of, of, of demand over renewable generation or vice versa. So in the left-hand side, there's more demand than renewable generation on the system. In the right-hand side, there's more renewable generation than demand on the system. And, and the, the black line is for the system without flexibility, the blue line is for the system with flexibility. And what you see is that we, we sort of drive down that curve and, and flatten that curve. And that means that this area under the curve represents about 22 terawatt hours of um, dispatchable generation that we don't need. That's 22 terawatt hours of gas turbines that we're not burning gas in order to create the electricity we need. And over on this side, 30 terawatt hours of renewables that don't get to curtailed because there was no demand to use them. We we're using our flexible demand to make better use of our renewables, which if you're investing in renewables, that's a better return on your investment in a solar farm or a wind farm or something like that, which helps create the case for putting more renewable generation onto the system in the first place. And we see that 15 gigawatt dispatch in our um, capacity, renewable capacity needs, that translates into reduced need for headroom in the network, reduced need, reduced need for expensive peaking plant that's only used for a very small number of hours in the year. So, so this all translates into an easier um, way of hitting net zero and less cost passed on to all of us as consumers. So Graham, we've got a couple of clusters of questions, one around technologies and their various roles in this, and one on sort of finances and how, how that works. Um, should we take the technologies cluster first? Um, let me just find the first one we're here. Uh, Finn was asking, is, is it possible to do net zero without the use of the nuclear, as there are many good reasons for avoiding nuclear? Yes, I think so. Um, that again, the sort of challenge tends to come in 
those days when you've got long periods without sun and wind. And also a big challenge is, is just the, the interseasonal variation. You need to have a lot more um, generation on the system for heating and things like that in winter than you do in, in the summer in the UK. Um, and then in other countries, Australia, America, it tends to be more in the summer for air conditioning load than in the winter. Um, and so um, you need some sort of plant that can accommodate that. Um, but a lot of it can be done with renewables. A lot of it can be done, particularly if you've got interconnectors that give you continental scale, then you've got much more likelihood that there will be wind somewhere in the continent. In fact, if you go to offshore wind, that's actually a pretty reliable source. So if you've got offshore wind in the Irish Sea and in the North Sea and get down into the Mediterranean or something like that, then the likelihood of there being no generation anywhere at that continental scale is pretty low. You can um, back that up with, again, particularly if you're prepared to use hydrogen and electrolysis to create hydrogen for hydrogen turbines, and absolutely you could do that. Um, and it, it's a sort of very moot point, I think, as to how much nuclear you need in the system. And, and I'm conscious that that gets into some wider debates around the, the kind of risks attached to nuclear plant, um, both economic and safety risks attached there, and uh, the economic and safety risks and efficiency risks attached to um, some of the other, the plant we're talking here. And um, Chris was also, um, you, you'd mentioned about EV chargers and people coming home and plugging them in and causing that peak in demand then. But obviously we're seeing now a rise in tariffs such as the, you know, the octopus on Tesla tariffs where um, you get encouraged to charge um, in the middle of the night. So um, to what extent do you think that that peak caused by people just plugging in versus a much smarter response to EVs will make a change? I think that that's a, a key part of the, the flexibility and we're sort of actually getting on to my final slide here. I think that those time of use tariffs will be a major way of encouraging people to charge their EVs at um, times of day when there's not much other demand on the system and there's, there's plenty of renewable generation. Now one of the issues there is that typically the tariffs, the, the more easy to accommodate tariffs, the sort of three tier EV tariffs that some suppliers are creating with a, a peak charge, a shoulder charge and an off peak charge. The, the timing for those tariffs is set months or you know a year ahead, you know what your tariffs are gonna be. Um, and that works for the average sort of demand, but it can't accommodate um, situations like the beast from the east where there's a sudden excess of um, demand driven by heating demand or that there's a, a lot of um, extra generation on the system, which might be predictable day ahead or week ahead. You might be able to predict those events, but you can't predict them a year ahead. And so those tariffs can't accommodate that. The agile tariff from Octopus, the type pricing on that is typically sent to you, I think about four o'clock in the afternoon, the day before. That can accommodate some of those variations, but it can't accommodate the fact that we, we never quite get our weather predictions right. And if, if we're out by half an hour about when the cold front hits us, then the, the tariff will be wrong. And they tend to be narrow, national rather than local, and there's local variation in this. Um, and they certainly can't accommodate back to one of the, the previous questions, what happens if a interconnector goes down and we suddenly need to get a whole bunch of excess or extra generation from our vehicle to grid fleet or reduce demand from our heat pumps, heat pumps because of this sudden change on the system. It's very hard to drive that from tariffs. So you need tariffs are part of the solution, but they're not the whole solution. That links quite nicely. We've had a question about, um, does the system get a step change when large generators like wind farms come on stream and how might that affect the market for flexible demand management? So you do get changes. I mean, generally, if a wind farm or something is, is 
starting to come on stream for some reason it's been curtailed because there's no demand and bring up that's that's a predictable event and it will be brought up in a a relatively smooth way but you do get um larger ramps of generation on the system because of that renewable generation and then the um, system operators around the world are seeing that with um, wind farms. You see that uh, in California, they talk about the duck curve as the, as the sort of shape of the curve. And you see much more ramp up as the evening peak of demand happens just as the sun is going down. And so you sort of see a, a sudden shift from excess um, generation from your solar to excess demand and you've got very large ramps there. And so you need to be able to accommodate that. And again, partly you can accommodate that through your tariff structure, creating tariffs that encourage demand to work around that. And partly you can use your flexibility in, elect in batteries or um, in your storage systems and your heating systems to accommodate those sorts of ramps. Um, other factors around this, again, you do get quite large ramps around wind farms when there's a lot of wind because they tend to cut out when they get when the wind goes beyond their maximum. And so you can actually see very large ramps on individual turbines, but often they won't, the ramp won't affect the entire wind farm because gusts of wind hit different turbines at different times. And so again, it's smoothed out by having a large number of turbines. And this is actually something that the traditional system kind of loses sight of. The system is used to having very high reliability in its plants because it's small, got a small number of them and they're built to be very high reliability. It looks at um, distributed generation and says, well, all these PV plants, all these EVs, none of them are as reliable as our plant. How, how can we count on reliability from all this unreliable plant? But actually the fact that you've got thousands, millions of these devices, the, the portfolio reliability can actually meet or exceed the individual reliability of the plant. And that, that's something that the traditional energy system overlooks when it thinks about renewable ener energy. Right, I'm conscious of time. So perhaps we'll save um, the finance questions um, if we've got time. So we should let you get on to the end of your presentation, Graham. Okay, and, I, and I will click over a couple of slides because I've said most of this, but again, my final slide really does come back to that question of how do people engage with this? And, and one of these is time of use tariffs. And this slide was actually written from the perspective of looking at a, as an energy supplier or as a, as a provider of energy services to consumers, how, how do we pass this through to, to people to engage with this? And part of it will be in time of use tariffs. And as I've said, it's hard to do this in real time. The tariffs ha are generally um, given to us months in advance or at best day ahead. So they can't accommodate sudden real time shifts. They also mean that the, the end consumer has to manage the complexity for themselves. They have to deal with the fact that Octopus is giving me 48 different tariffs for different times of the day. And, and I have to choose when to turn my heat pump on and off and things like that to exploit that, which typically means that I have um, acronym the HEMS or Home Energy Management System. I have some sort of software to manage that for me, but I, I need to now think about who's my agent that's managing my system for me. It creates a lot of complexity for me. Um, and at the extreme end of this, I get to peer-to-peer to -peer kinds of models, which again is very attractive from the perspective of ownership of the system, but puts a lot of the complexity and the risk onto me. If my agent gets it wrong, then I'm the person who's not going to be able to boil the kettle and I, and I have to wear that risk. There's no one managing that for me. Um, and the other way to do this in a sense is energy service type models. And I think we'll particularly see this with things like EVs where you're starting to see um, when people buy EVs, you know, most people or many people these days when they buy cars, they don't actually buy them, they lease them. They get them on um, personal finance plans, personal contract plans of some sort. And so they're just paying a, a fixed monthly charge for their car. You're starting to see um, people say, we'll throw in 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 miles a month of driving and the, the charging that goes with that. And we will manage the 
charging of your EV. So we will guarantee there's always energy there in the battery when you need it, but we will choose when to charge and discharge the battery in order to deliver the best value for the system. And that, that's part of their business model. That makes it simple for me. I don't have to, to worry about all these questions of when I charge my car and setting timers and things like that. Um, there's, there's someone that's just making life simple for me. And again, I don't think it's going to be an either or world. I think that both these models will appeal to different types of consumers. And I can see a world where you'll have some of your appliances in the home managed as services and EVs, a good example of that, and other things where be happy to work with more of a, a time of use type tariff model for, for some people. So the real sort of thing I wanted to come back to the, with this is that this is all about an energy system that's fit for my kettle. It's putting my kettle at the heart of my energy system. Whereas the energy system, amazing as it is, has really started, you know, come to a place over the decades where it's the big plant and the big corporates that are at the heart of it. And now we're really getting back to this place where my, my kettle really is a key player in the energy system. And I think that's really exciting. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Greg. We've got questions flooding in. Let's see how many we can um, answer in the last few minutes. Um, let me find the first few that we missed. Um, I've, I also love the fact that people are answering um, and providing information to answer other people's questions as we're going. We've got such an engaged and informed audience. Um, Sarah Couch was asking, do we expect energy from a local grid to be cheaper? So from a lot of, um, say, PV, the, the marginal cost is zero. It's effectively free. So it's the same whether it comes from the, the PV on my roof or it comes from the PV in a wind farm somewhere down in, in a solar farm somewhere down in Cornwall. Um, the marginal cost is the same. Now, the investment cost is different. There's probably an economy of scale in putting that solar farm into the um, field in Cornwall or something like that. So there's probably some sort of overall investment cost that needs to be recouped that makes that um, PV farm slightly cheaper than the PV on my roof. But on the other hand, to get from Cornwall to my home, you need a whole lot of copper and transmission networks and distribution networks that have to be paid for somewhere. So there should be lower costs in the, the network charges because I'm not transporting the energy so far. Um, and again, this gets into questions of how we recover costs of the network. I probably still want to have that transmission network because if it's cloudy over my PV, but sunny in Cornwall, then I still want to have that transmission network in place to transport to transfer the energy to me. So the transmission network is there as an insurance policy, but I'm not using it quite so much. So I need to pay for it somehow, but not for as much of it as if I'm using it every day. And that, that's a, a very complex economic discussion that's going on with Ofgem right now. And I hope, Chris, that goes some way to answer your question about the relative economics of local solar PV farms compared with on-roof residential solar PV. And it's one of the things we're going to be look at, looking at in Project LEO is understanding how the financial benefits um, get distributed between all the different potential players. Um, because as um, Graham's mentioned, you maybe um, get economies of scale and build, but if you're not on um, from ground mount, but if you're not directly above the roof, you've not got that direct link to where the consumption is happening. So, um, yes, it's a tangled web that we want to be looking into. Alan was asking, would the local electricity bill help on this front as well? So, the, the, I think there's a, a lot of mileage in local energy suppliers. Um, the, the local e electricity bill, I think, was a starting point. I think it was a, it was kind of a flag-waving exercise to, to, to draw attention. And th there's still a lot of work to be done with that particular bill to sort of translate it into 
um, what's needed to create local energy suppliers and, and, and to manage that. Uh, but that's exactly the sort of um, question that I think we're looking at in projects like LEO. I'm also working on the Manchester's local energy market project, which is looking at exactly those types of problems as to how you can create some of those local supply models. Um, and again, I think there's a, a lot of potential for that local supplier to manage some of the network charges and things like that differently, which potentially helps um, create financial as well as sort of um, local sustainability benefits around local supply. Um, and a question from Fabian, is there a financial incentive for large consumers to offer, um, such as data centres, to offer grid services in this scenario? And so data centres are, are starting to um, look at this going back to, to Upside, the, the name Upside actually came from um, un, 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 uninterruptible power supplies, UPSs. That was our first thing that we were targeting, which are the, the battery systems that typically sit in front of things like data centers to provide their backup power. And so data centers do have battery systems and they can provide um, flexibility to the grid for things like frequency response from those. And, and we're starting to see um, trends from data centers. Um, there's lots of interesting things that you can also do with data centers around things like heat. Data centers produce an enormous amount of heat in the servers and they consume a lot of energy running air conditioning to, to get rid of that heat. Um, there are some data centers in the Netherlands, for example, that are looking at taking that heat into district heating systems. And so there's some really interesting things you can do around data centers if they're sited in the right place and if you're starting to build the um, right sort of systems around that. And we're just starting on some of those journeys around data centers still. So um, sadly, we are out of time. We do have a couple of questions we haven't been able to answer. I don't know if Graham, you've got, can join us for one more minute or uh, do you That's need fine to? for me, yeah. So um, to those that do need to leave us, thank you so much for your time. We'll just take a couple more questions and, and then wrap up. That's very kind of you, Graham. Thank you. So we had a question from, uh, let me find it, uh, from Bruce. Is there any role of value in a local DC grid, either at a home or community level? It's a really good question. And, and again, one of the, the losses in the system is that a lot of our appliances these days run on DC. And so in, in some um, solar PV configurations, you have PV generating DC, that then's converted to AC to feed into the system, that then's converted back to DC to run our appliances. And so there is benefits in terms of efficiency losses in having DC within the home. How far you extend that, um, you could um, potentially have DC microgrids operating at campus level, that collections of homes level. I'm actually working on a European project called Empower, where the Belgian partner, I think it's University of Ghent, is looking at um, DC microgrids for, for that sort of use. Um, and so there are if, um, efficiency losses. Going back to data centers, a lot of data centers um, run on a, a DC microgrid that they recognized um, that they were incurring a lot of those conversion losses and have started to build DC microgrids. So you can see scope for that. Right now, a lot of the engineering standards don't accommodate that. Um, and again, this, there was the film about the um, recent film about Tesla um, versus Edison. Um, this goes back to AC versus DC and that there were lots of discussions around what was most efficient and a lot of the traditional issues where it's hard to transfer DC energy over large distances. We now can do that with high volts DC. And so if we were building a system from scratch now, we'd probably have more DC in it, but we're not building from scratch. We've got a traditional system with a lot of AC and how we make that transition to more DC is a, is a big unanswered question, but you could certainly see scope for local microgrids, like I say, within buildings, particularly being built for DC. Thank you. And I think this will have to be our last 
um, question, if I can just locate again, right at the top, so I'm feeling very guilty about missing it earlier, from Chris. Um, how do you see the potential for gravity storage for local energy storage systems? So it's already one of the major sources of storage in the pumped hydro. So all that's happening with the things like the Norweg is that they pump a, bump of, a bunch of water up into a dam and then let it, when there's spare energy in the system, they use that energy to run the pumps and then they reverse that and run the water back through the turbines. And so gravity plays a, ma plays a major role now. Um, where, whether it will play a role in other uses, there's certainly people, various people looking at um, things like um, mine shafts and running um, large weights up and down in mine, mine shafts. So pumping the weight or driving the weight up to the top of the shaft when there's spare energy and then letting the, the, it drop. Um, and you could operate that at all sorts of scales. The economics, I don't think are quite there right now, um, but they do have benefits in terms of things like um, the number of cycles you can get from those, those systems. One of the limitations of battery systems is that gradually our batteries degrade and you can only get a certain number of thousands of cycles before you need to replace the battery, which then gets into all the questions of disposal of batteries and things like that. Whereas often um, the gravity driven mechanical systems, as long as you maintain them properly, can get large numbers of cycles from them. So there are benefits, but outside of the pumped hydro, I can't think of too many places where they're, they're mainstream right now. That's um, a great note to finish it on in terms of, I think we've covered almost every technology there, <laughs> every option. And I'm really looking forward to working with Graham over the next few years. And uh, so many of those who are in the audience, in fact, as part of the Smart and Fair trials that we're going to be carrying out, looking at this question of, um, flexibility and its role in in local energy so thank you so much for joining us i do apologize if we've missed your question the chat has just been alive with messages flooding in so it's great to see such a um, large number of questions coming through and um as I mentioned at the beginning, we are going to be sending out a um, short survey to everyone who's uh, registered for the webinars because we'd love your feedback as we prepare for um, our next series. So it just leaves me to say a huge thank you to you, Graham, a massive thank you to our audience and really look forward to seeing you all again in the autumn. Thank you for joining us. Thanks Saskia and thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>